Welcome to the Southern IPM Hour. We are very excited to have a talk today about ambrosia beetles. We um, saw that there was some interest drumming up around it, and we wanted to make sure that we got the uh, one of the best sources of information that we could on this. Um, by the way, I'm Kayla Watson. I'm the Communication Director at the Southern IPM Center. We are one of four regional IPM centers supported by the USDA NIFA Crop Protection and Pest Management Regional Coordination Program. And we have a mission to coordinate IPM across the region. So um, this is one of the fun ways that we get to do that. And uh, as I said, today we're gonna to be talking about ambrosia beetles and we've got Chris Ranger with us today. Uh, and Chris has graciously offered to share some of the information that the Southern IPM Center Working Group uh, for Ambrosia Beetles has found and just some general information about Ambrosia Beetles. So if you have any questions as we go throughout the webinar, we will be holding those till the end. But if you want to type them somewhere so you don't forget, you can type those into the Q&A panel located at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And uh, we'll get to those at the end of this presentation. So Chris, thanks so much for being here today. We're really looking forward to this. Great, thanks Kayla for the generous introduction and to Joe also for the, for the offer uh, to present. I must point out that uh, Dr. Angel Acebes uh, had, was initially supposed to be uh, presenting today. Uh, Angel is an assistant professor with the University of Georgia. Uh, so she was gonna give her perspective in terms of the Southeastern United States uh, with particularly with respect to ambrosia beetles and pecans, uh, but Angel had another commitment come up. And so she asked me to uh, present what we have been finding, uh, the research that we've conducted over the past 10 to 15 years on ambrosia beetles, really with an emphasis on ornamentals. Uh, I'm a research entomologist with the USDA in Worcester, Ohio. Uh, and we've had collaborators, as I'll mention here shortly, in other, in other locations uh, in the Midwest and Eastern and Southeastern United States. Uh, so basically, you know, the perspective today is, is on ambrosia beetles within ornamentals in particular, but um, they're becoming more and more of a problem in tree fruit systems and tree nut systems. And so uh, we've formed uh, another working group uh, through the Southern IPM Center uh, to address uh, these really challenging insects. Okay, so ambrosia beetles are wood boring insects. And as a result, they're commonly intercepted at ports of entry. And that is within live plants or plant products or wood packaging materials. There are currently 30 non-native or exotic species in North America. Now, not, fortunately, not all of those um, are, are pest status, but there are some key species that are problematic uh, for attacking trees. And uh, overall, ambrosia beetles are considered uh, among the most successful invaders for a few uh, key biological traits uh, that I'll that I'll mention throughout my talk, but basically they're really difficult uh, and very good uh, biological invaders. So a lot of the research that I'll be mentioning uh, was conducted uh, with support from the USDA Floriculture and Nursery Research Initiative and the Horticultural Research Institute, with uh, researchers listed here. Um, but uh, as I mentioned. Uh, Angel Seves uh, initiated uh, an ambrosia beetle working group through the Southern IPM Center. And so those uh, researchers are listed here and uh, they represent um, a number of different disciplines in terms of plant pathology and entomology and um, horticulture and economics. And so, and also a number of different regions uh, from, of course, the Midwest and Ohio, but also the Eastern uh, US and Southeastern and, and Southern US and different cropping systems, for instance, ornamentals and tree fruits and tree nut systems. And so uh, this is the uh, group right now that uh, 
we, we submitted a pre-proposal. I want to point out, we submitted a pre-proposal uh, to the Specialty Crop Research Initiative uh, titled Ecology and Integrated Management of Ambrosia Beetles in Eastern Orchard and Ornamental Tree Crops. And, and we were fortunately enough, uh, fortunate enough to be invited to submit a full proposal. And so this proposal is due May 21st, and um, it's gonna use that team that I just mentioned uh, to prepare a research and extension and economic analysis uh, related to ambrosia beetles and tree fruits and tree nuts and ornamentals. And we're going to address a variety of aspects related to uh, these really challenging and difficult insects. So today I'm going to address uh, some, some frequently asked questions in terms of ambrosia beetles. For instance, what species of ambrosia beetles are problematic? What are the symptoms of an infestation? What is their biology and life history? What trees do they attack? How do I monitor for them? And what management tactics are effective? So I'll start off with what species of ambrosia beetles are problematic in ornamental nurseries, but this does extend to other cropping systems, as I'll point out. So the black stem borer, also known by its scientific name, Xylosandris germanus, is native to Southeast Asia. It was first reported from New York in 1932, and it's now established in 32 of 50 US states and also in several uh, Canadian provinces. Now the males are flightless, so it's just the female that flies and it's the female that initiate attacks. Now the female can, can produce offspring without mating, that's referred to as haplodiploid reproduction. So that is one of the features that makes this beetle a very good invader. It's essentially you just need one female to uh, initiate a, a producing offspring. And so uh, this particular in, oops, excuse me, this particular insect, uh, you can see here that it has this kind of head capsule that covers the, the head, the pronote, which is referred to as the pronotum. And um, it's not a particularly large insect. I mean, really it's, it's, uh, it, it almost is, is, it looks relatively cigar shaped and um, they tend to be, uh, for Zotostanus germanus, a little bit on uh, somewhat black, whereas some of the other species have more of a reddish color to them. Um, but there are resources available in terms of helping uh, growers and extension agents to identify these beetles. And I'm happy to provide more insight into that if, if, if someone would like to reach out or to your local extension agent. So um, the granulate ambrosia beetle uh, is uh, another key species, Zosandris crassusculus. Now that's also native to Southeast Asia. It was re first reported from South Carolina in 1974, attacking uh, uh, peach trees. And it's now established in 29 of 50 states and also Ontario. Now, while Zalosanus germanus tends to, is more abundant and tends to be uh, more problematic in the upper Midwest and the Northeastern United States, Zalosanus crassus culus, the granulate ambrosia beetle, is more problematic and more abundant in the Southeastern and Southern United States. And so these are the two species here. Zalosanus crassus culus is a little bit larger than germanus. Now, there are uh, some other destructive species, but really uh, the, the, the two that we're going to focus on for this talk and the two that have been most problematic in ornamental nurseries up until now uh, are, are these two species. Uh, but there are others that, are, that definitely are, are causing issues. So symptoms of an infestation. So again, these are wood boring insects. And so they, the, the females create a, a narrow uh, hole or tunnel into the, the, the tree. And it's basically about, about one millimeter in diameter. And so sometimes the attacks are very obvious and other times they're not. And so you can see here that these are, these are um, the tunnel entrances that the females created as she was boring, uh, burrowing into the tree. So one key symptom of an ambrosia beetle attack 
are sawdust toothpicks. And these toothpicks are produced as the beetle is tunneling into the tree. She's not eating the wood. She's just moving it out of the way. And somehow she then, as a result of the tooth, the sawdust essentially being compacted together, th this toothpick-like structure will then stick out from the tree. Now that after a, a good rain or if it's really windy, you might not see these uh, toothpicks, but if you do, it's uh, a very distinct indication that, that, uh, that the trees are being attacked by ambrosia beetles. Another key feature that's associated with ambrosia beetle attacks is, is the, the defensive sap production that, that the trees will produce oftentimes, not always, but trees will produce in response to attacks by ambrosia beetles. And this can then cause issues in terms of um, discoloration of the stem and perhaps promote uh, secondary microorganisms. So, so really not um, desirable and, and very problematic. Uh, really the, the biggest issue with ambrosia beetles is of course the branch dieback and tree death that often occurs as a result of the attacks. And unfortunately, this can occur very quickly. Uh, in other words, beetles can rapidly attack trees, growers in some cases will come out and suddenly notice extensive dieback in several trees within a row. Uh, and uh, that will happen very quickly, essentially overnight. And so that makes, again, for a challenging pest to, to manage. Okay, in terms of their biology and life history, so as it turns out, we're not the only fungus farmers, right? Actually, ambrosia beetles started doing it somewhere between 40 to 100 million years ago. And so ambrosia beetles uh, propagate and cultivate their fungal gardens. So the females carry spores of their fungal simonon, they tunnel into the tree, and the fungus is what they actually feed on. So the larvae and the, and the adults must consume the fungal symbiont in order to acquire nutrition. So they're not feeding on the tree, they're feeding on the fungal symbiont that they're growing within the tree. So the beetles tunnel deep within the trees. And so once they're inside, they then produce these fung fung establish the fungal gardens if the fungal gardens uh, are then, once the fungal gardens are then, are then flourishing, the female will then begin laying eggs and producing offspring. As you can see here, uh, uh, this is a, a gallery uh, on the right, and you can see larvae and some eggs in, in within this gallery. So in terms of the fungal sima, as I mentioned, the female has this pouch in between the prothorax and her elytra, the abdomen. And so within this pouch, she's carrying spores of the fungal symbiont, which you can see here in their high magnification. And this pouch-like structure forms two lobes that you can see here. And so in terms of the fungal symbiont, it's not free living. So it doesn't exist in the absence of the beetles, okay? So, so it's totally dependent on the beetles for transport and essentially for propagation. Uh, and then on the other hand, the beetles are totally dependent on their fungal symbiont for a source of nourishment. Uh, the, two, the, the, the fungal symbionts that are associated with Zoosanders germanis, the fungal symbiont is Ambrosiella grossmanniae, and the fungal symbiont associated with Zoosanders crassusculus is Ambrosiella roperi. Now, I should point out that both of these species of, of fungal symbionts are not considered to be um, pathogenic. Uh, so, so, so plant pathologists do not consider these uh, symbionts to be true pathogens. Uh, but again, we do see branch dieback and tree death. And one of the things that we do not yet understand 
is what is the basis for tree dieback and tree and branch dieback and tree death? And that is one of the topics that uh, we're going to propose as part of our specialty crop research initiative proposal uh, is, is what trying to determine what in fact is happening. There is some anecdotal evidence that the tree um, responds with a hypersensitive reaction. The tree might be killing itself actually by, by um, defending itself and creating uh, necrotic tissue uh, around the site of the infection. And as a result, ultimately you have uh, essentially girdling of the tree where it's not able to transport water and nutrients properly. Uh, it's also possible that, um, that other microorganisms could be um, inducing a, a, a pathogenic response by, on, on part of the trees. So as I mentioned, you have beetles tunneling into the trees and, um, and, and creating extensive, extensive problems. So in addition to the fungal symbionts that are, again, not considered pathogens, but might perhaps be able to uh, disrupt the vascular tissue, the vascular system within the tree, um, in addition to the symbionts, there are a variety of microorganisms, some of which are known to be pathogenic, uh, th that are associated with the surfaces of ambrosia beetles. And so it is possible that as beetles tunnel into the trees, they're introducing secondary microorganisms that will then uh, result in, in dieback. And so again, this, this, this concept is not well characterized. Um, and so we're hoping to shed some light on that. And of course, by understanding what factors are causing die, branch dieback and, and tree death, we can then develop management tactics to help uh, growers um, reduce that, that risk. So in terms of flight activity, so the, as I mentioned, the beetles are tunneling in deep within the tree. So they spend their, uh, they spend the, the winter inside of trees as an adult. So when spring comes, they're fully ready and capable to leave that host tree and fly into a nursery and fly, or fly into an orchard and begin looking for a new tree to attack. So they're really just waiting for um, what we found. We're, they're really just waiting for two to three days that are above 70 degrees and then you're going to have uh, beetles flying. And so we often see the peak number of beetles trapped. So on the, on the y-axis is number of beetles that were trapped in uh, ethanol beta traps. And then on the x-axis here, of course, is time. And so this is from Ohio in 2015. And you can see we have this uh, this peak flight activity of beetles in, in spring, uh, which for us here in Ohio generally occurs in mid-May. And then uh, the, these beetles that are again emerging from the trees that they overwintered in will then fly uh, to new trees, attack those trees, establish new galleries and produce offspring. And then later in the summer here in Ohio, it's generally mid-July, we then see a second, or excuse me, a second peak, but a first generation of beetles that then leave those trees and, and, and again, look for additional hosts to attack. But usually um, the, the peak activity is in early spring. And so of course in Southern states, this, that, this can really be extended in terms of uh, a definitive uh, second generation and um, almost year-round activity, uh, depending on uh, how far south. And so um, for us here in Ohio, the majority of attacks uh, are, are, are generally associated with the, uh, it, are generally documented or observed in the, in the spring uh, with, with that emergence of overwinter adults. So as I mentioned, um, the flight activity dramatically increases with two to three days that are above 70 degrees. Now, it seems like once you start going, this was, these were data that were generated here in Ohio, but uh, it seems like once you start 
uh, getting into the southern U.S. that uh, this 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 uh, uh, this predictive capability is no longer effective, and so uh, we really it would be helpful to understand seasonal activity. Um, in, in uh, other locations, other regions, and, and, and to understand how that uh, correlates with act, uh, attacks on trees. So generally, um, in terms of flight activity, uh, for, for March to April, in terms of capturing first the first beetles, uh, there's, there's several states here that are listed, which generally have their first captures uh, somewhere between March to April. And, um, Jason Oliver with Tennessee State University uh, has, has found that, um, that there seems to be a pretty strong correlation between, uh, or, or a correlation between the flower and the eastern red buds and ambrosia beetle activity. But again, something that uh, we can expand upon. So, so you have beetles that are in trees uh, that are adjacent to uh, ornamental nurseries. So as you can see here, uh, this is a woodlot in which the beetles would be overwintering. And then you have um, an aerial shot of a ornamental nursery. So beetles are then going to leave those uh, wooded areas and fly into the nursery to look for trees to attack. Okay, so what trees do they attack? So for the black stem borer, Zosandrus germanus, again, which tends to be more abundant and more problematic in the Midwestern and Northeastern US, they are documented or have been documented to attack more than 200 tree species worldwide. Uh, the granulate and brogia beetle, Zosandrus crassusculus, that has been documented to attack more than 120 species worldwide. And so, the point here is that both of these species have really broad host range. So that means that they're capable of attacking a, a wide diversity of tree species. Again, which makes them especially challenging insects to manage. Now, they do tend to attack uh, deciduous trees and Usually it's thin bark trees. Of course, there's always exceptions, but at least within ornamental nurseries. And then what we're seeing from, from uh, tree fruit orchards is that deciduous trees that are thin barked, uh, you know, some of the, on the younger side uh, are, are, are generally the trees that are, that are attacked. Now, these beetles have really been long characterized as secondary pests of dying or dead trees. But growers have reported uh, attacks on trees that they considered to be apparently healthy. In other words, there were no uh, symptoms, um, no obvious symptoms of stress associated with these trees. So that has been a really important component of my research program is to understand the host selection behavior of ambrosia beetles. Why are they attacking certain trees over others? If they have this really broad host range uh, to attack a wide diversity of trees, why do we see basically the opposite? Why do we see beetles specifically attacking certain trees? And so for instance, one of the things that we did within ornamental nurseries was to characterize the distribution of attacked trees in two different plots at two different nurseries. And so the black dots here represent trees that were not attacked, and the red dots represent trees that were attacked. And the larger the uh, circle, the more attacks there were on that individual tree. And so basically what we found was that this was not a random process. In other words, it was not the case that beetles were just randomly fly, r randomly attacking trees within these two plots. Even though they had the capability to attack all these different species that were here, they were specifically targeting certain trees. And so it was not random, it was actually very specific. 
And so again, we found that only certain species and actually only certain individuals were attacked. And, and there were several instances where there were very high attacks on one tree and then the tree right next to it had no attacks at all. But we do see this, or end, we do see this really distinct clustering effect where beetles are attacking trees and, and there are often clusters of trees that are attacked within a row, but adjacent rows might not have any attacks at all. And so I should point out that before I discuss ethanol, I should point out that there are some insects and there are some bark beetles and that, that use a pheromone to attract insects to a tree <clears throat> and then essentially mass attack a tree, okay? We don't, there, are, there there's no pheromone that's known to be produced by an ambrosia beetles. So as far as why beetles are attacking certain trees over others, we don't see, we've, there's, there's not been a pheromone that's been, uh, there's no evidence for it and one has not been found. And in fact, what we find is that volatiles that are produced by the tree are actually what make the tree attractive to attack. And in particular, ethanol is a uh, really important attractant uh, for ambrosia beetles. And so for instance, in this particular experiment here, uh, this is time on the x-axis, and on the y-axis you have cumulative attacks by ambrosia beetles. And so we had trees that were baited with ethanol lures. So an ethanol lure was placed next to the tree and you can see the, the circles where we circled attacks uh, on the trees that were baited with ethanol. And then we also had trees that were not baited with ethanol. And so as you can see, um, we ended up with about 15 attacks per tree on the ethanol baited trees, but no attacks on the non-baited or unbaited trees. And then the attacks essentially stopped. There were no attacks after this point in time. Well, that represents the point in time at which we purposefully removed the ethanol lure. And so once the ethanol lure was, was removed, once the trees were no longer associated with ethanol, the beetles were no longer uh, attracted to those trees. We've also done work where uh, trees can be injected with ethanol, and this is helpful for inducing attacks on trees. And um, the reason why we would want to induce attacks on trees, for instance, is that uh, it allows us to do efficacy trials with, with insecticides and also understand their, their biology and behavior. Um, in the past, researchers had put out trees uh, that were not attractive because they were not emitting ethanol and treated the trees with different insecticidal products and didn't receive any attacks on the untreated trees because they weren't emitting ethanol. So therefore you could, the data couldn't be interpreted. And so basically the point here is that if you use a pressurized injection system to inject ethanol into the trees, an increasing concentration of ethanol results in um, an increase in attacks, which are on the, the, the y-axis here. And so you can see the 90% results in just really heavy attacks where you have just sawdust piling up around the stem of the tree. And of course, no attacks on trees not emitting ethanol. So one of the other experiments that we did was to look at the landing behavior of the beetles. And so we placed a, a tree emitting ethanol in the center of a plot. And then we had trees that were uh, not injected with ethanol at varying distances from the tree that was emitting ethanol. And some of those trees were treated with uh, tanglefoot, which is an adhesive. So the purpose of that was to look at landing rates of the ambrosia beetles. So you can see here, uh, Ozaosanus germanus that had landed on this tree and became stuck in the tanglefoot. And the purpose of that was to understand how efficient beetles can find a tree emitting ethanol. Are they landing randomly on trees that are not emitting ethanol or are they very efficiently finding the trees emitting ethanol? And so basically what we found is that they have a very efficient host location mechanism, that they, the number of beetles landing on trees not emitting ethanol 
was very low and they were very efficient at locating trees emitting ethanol. And so these ambrosia beetles have a really strong affinity for ethanol to the point where they were documented to attack uh, gasoline canisters. I believe this is in Alabama uh, because of the ethanol um, additive. And then it's a uh, humorous um, you know, joke um, among the members of the ambrosia beetle community that if you're sitting out on your porch uh, having an adult beverage uh, in spring, oftentimes uh, you'll see an ambrosia beetle uh, coming to say hello, and that might be in a glass of wine in Worcester, Ohio, or a glass of beer in Würzburg, Germany. So the emission of ethanol, why, why is ethanol emitted from trees? Well, it's emitted in response to a variety of physiological stressors, and that can be flooding, frost injury, uh, drought, um, girdling pollutants, pathogens, uh, impaired root function, I should add to herbicide damage. And so um, what we have seen in particular is that flooding and low temperature stress are really the key factors that are resulting in the emission of ethanol and triggering attacks by ambrosia beetles in, in ornamental nurseries. Uh, drought, uh, I, I'm not going to present any drought data today. Day, uh, but we have not found that a short-term drought event to be uh, inducing attacks. Now, it could be a scenario where if you have a drought event and then the trees, the root systems are, are impaired to the point where uh, they do not recover. And then later on, uh, you, you, you could potentially, there could potentially be a scenario where, where it could happen, but but really for, for what we've seen, flooding and, and frost injury are the, the key factors. Now, the important thing to keep in mind is that the, the ethanol can, is, is em, emitted from trees within one to two days of the trees being, being flood stressed or frost injured. So it's a very rapid response where, be, where the trees will start to produce ethanol. And so those trees can absolutely look apparently healthy, uh, but they're in fact emitting stress-related volatiles, particularly ethanol, that signals to the beetles that uh, they're vulnerable and, uh, and a good, a good uh, host tree to attack. So in terms of the production of ethanol, uh, basically with a flood stress tree, when the, when the roots are deprived of oxygen, you have the cells uh, switching from aerobic respiration to anaerobic respiration. And a byproduct of anaerobic respiration is, is ethanol, which is then, in the case of a flood stress tree, the ethanol is produced in the roots. It then travels up the stems, a stem and is emitted from the, the, the bark and also from the leaves. But we find it to be most, uh, the highest concentration of emission from the, from the leaves. Uh, excuse me, from the stems. So just to give you an idea, uh, this, this particular grower had dogwoods that were planted in a low-lying area of his nursery. We had record precipitation in Northeastern Ohio in spring 2011, and uh, attacks uh, were observed uh, um, not long after that record precipitation. And so the grower, uh, reported this and we went up and took a look at the trees and sure enough, 99% of the trees exhibited dieback, which you can see here, but 29% of these trees were not attacked by ambrosia beetles. And so the, the, the point is that it was obvious, it quickly became obvious that while we had initially thought that all these trees were attacked and all these trees died because of the ambrosia beetle attack, that was not the case because there were some trees that were symptomatic but did not have any ambrosia beetle attacks. And so, for instance, this is one of those trees and you can see the necrotic zone moving up from the root system. And so basically it was an indication that, uh, that there was an abiotic, presumably abiotic stressor, there were indications of, of flood stress, uh, the grower noted that these trees were in a low-lying area. It didn't drain. Dogwoods are known to be 
intolerant to flood stress conditions. Um, and so in addition to the flood stress, uh, there was also some indications that planting depth could, could have been an issue. For instance, these dogwoods here, uh, you can see the soil line is, is, is you know, much higher than a dogwood would, would generally prefer. So based on that observation, uh, we conducted a series of experiments uh, looking at uh, flood stress and its ability to induce attacks. And we used dogwoods and sure enough, um, beetles are attracted to flood stress trees uh, and, and flood stress in the trees induces, induces attacks by beetles. And as I'll mention here in a minute, we found that flood intolerant trees were preferentially attacked over flood tolerant trees. And of course we found ethanol being emitted from those trees. So for instance, we did an experiment where we um, put trees that ranged in their tolerance of, of flood stress from intolerant to tolerant out under field condition, uh, under, under, in, their, in a woodlot to allow for really heavy ambrosia beetle pressure, and then looked at the attacks on those trees. And so on the X axis here, you have days after initiating flood stress and cumulative attacks. And so as you can see, even after three days um, of those trees being flood stress, uh, attacks started to occur. And the beetles preferentially attacked the trees that were flood intolerant over trees that were moderately tolerant, tolerant like swamp oak and river birch. And so basically you had uh, J Japanese snowbell or styrax and dogwoods and also red buds being preferentially attacked when, in response to flood stress, but no attacks on the non-flooded trees and the more tolerant trees again were, were uh, not attacked. Uh, so we analyzed for ethanol in those trees and uh, sure enough, we found higher levels of ethanol in the intolerant trees versus the moderately tolerant to tolerant trees. And ethanol is not detected in the, in the um, non-flooded trees. So based on this information, we worked with uh, Steve Frank at uh, NC State, and uh, he monitored uh, medium moisture levels in uh, ornamental nurseries and found that in many cases, uh, their, their mo medium moisture was, was 50 to 90%, so really quite high. Uh, and so basically, he recommended that, that uh, being below 50% for flood intolerant species um, is an ideal threshold for ambrosia beetles to try to minimize the risk of attacks. Now, we were interested in assessing how well beetles, if beetles could even colonize uh, a healthy non-flooded tree. And so we caged beetles with no choice to those trees. And basically what happened was that on the, the non-flooded trees, um, we had very little tunneling. The tunnels were just superficial. Um, there was more sawdust produced on the flood stress trees. Uh, and, and on the, the flooded trees, um, we had beetles that produced uh, eggs, larvae, pupae, and established their fungal, gar fungal gardens. Whereas on the non-flooded trees, there was zero colonization of those trees. Now, I want to again point out that flood stress is not the only factor that's going to predispose trees to attack. And we really do not have a, a good sense right now of what the stressors are in uh, tree nut systems like pecans and what the stressors are in tree fruit orchards. And so that again is part of the research that we're planning on, on conducting if, if our SCRI proposal is, is funded. Uh, and so um, but but there, there's evidence um, of, again, frost injury predisposing trees to attack. And so this was work that was done uh, over in, in Belgium uh, with Zaza Sanders Germanis, where they found that extreme frost events were um, preceded by uh, attacks by, uh, excuse me, ambrosia beetle attacks were preceded by uh, extreme frost events. And so we've seen, again, similar to flood stress, we've seen instances, uh, anecdotal evidence from nurseries where you had, um, where we had mild winters, uh, 
and, and in particular, uh, April was actually colder than, than March in 2012. We had five significant frost events that April, and we had um, a free stress of trees, and that resulted in, in uh, extensive and broach beetle attacks. And so um, this is uh, a, an example of uh, a free stress tree in Virginia in 2014. We've also seen this occur in uh, of landscape trees. Uh, and so um, we found again that free stress uh, induces attacks by ambrosia beetles and also induces the emission of ethanol from those trees. And so um, here you have uh, a series, of, a series of experiments where you have days after field deployment on the, the x-axis and cumulative attacks on the y-axis. And basically uh, we have styrax, dogwood, and red buds. And uh, on the free stress trees, you had attacks, but I think on all the non-free stress untreated trees, we didn't have any, any attacks. And so again, just, just emphasizing the, the role of stress. Um, interestingly, we did see that if you looked at the attacks, the vertical distribution of attacks on the stem, we found that, uh, so, so on, on the y-axis, you have number of attacks, and on the x-axis, you have distance from the base. And so basically, what we found for the flood stress trees is that the attacks generally occurred down near the base of the stem, Whereas on the free stress trees, they generally occurred farther up the stem and into the canopy. So this is helpful because it does provide an indication perhaps of what stressor might have predisposed. Uh, the, the distribution of attacks on the stem could, could perhaps provide an indication of what stressor. Is it a root impairment? Is it something having to do with the, the whole stem tissue? Uh, so I just wanted to mention that you know, I, I've, I've emphasized the, the role of ethanol and, um, you know, it occurred to us that it would, it seems really counterproductive for, for ambrosia beetles to farm their fungal symbiont in the presence of ethanol. I mean, to the point where they will specifically attack uh, the tissue on a tree that has ethanol present, but they will avoid tissues or essentially not tunnel into tissues that, in the absence of ethanol. And so that seems strange to us because ethanol has been you know, known to be an attractant for ambrosia beetles going back to the 40s. But in early history, ethanol has been used for antiseptic properties. And so even now, of course, right, everyone's hand uh, sanitizer is, that's ethanol. And uh, so we thought, well, why would ambrosia beetles want to form their fungal symbiote in there? So just due to time constraints, I won't go into the, the uh, the, the series of experiments that we did with this, but basically what we ended up finding out or demonstrating was that the presence of ethanol actually promotes the growth of the fungal symbiont. So the fungal symbiont grows better in the presence of ethanol, depending on the concentration. Obviously, if it gets too concentrated, it doesn't grow well, but it basically grows grows well in the presence of ethanol. And the presence of that ethanol can suppress the growth of unwanted microorganisms. So basically the beetles are selecting this environment that's really beneficial to their fungus farming. And so if we understand this process, we can therefore try to uh, facilitate the metabolism of ethanol, try to disrupt the um, colonization, try to, because again, the, the, the ambrosia beetle will not begin laying eggs until the fungal symbiont is established. And so if we understand what factors influence the establishment of the fungal symbiont, then we can perhaps disrupt that and prevent colonization from taking place. Okay, so how do I monitor for them? So as you can guess, ethanol or ethyl alcohol is the key. You can purchase uh, commercially available lures. Uh, or you can make your own. I would recommend purchasing just because uh, you'll have a consistent release rate. You don't have to worry about refilling the, the dispenser. Uh, denatured alcohol is okay, but don't use isopropyl alcohol, rubbing alcohol. That will not be effective. Um, you can prepare bottle traps. Um, and again, I would reach out to an extension agent or I'm happy to provide insight if, if needed. 
Uh, and, and this is basically what you're going to see is these uh, cigar shaped beetles that, uh, will, well, not that and not that, uh, these three that will be uh, present in your, in your traps. Now, uh, stems can also be soaked in ethanol, 10% ethanol overnight, and then placed out in the field. Uh, the researchers also um, core or drill out the center of the stem, fill it with ethanol, and then plug it with a rubber stopper, and you can see what happens. Um, of course, you can flood stress trees to induce attacks. Um, but the advantage to this one advantage, I mean, there are some disadvantages, but an advantage to this is that you can actually see when the attacks are occurring. So it might be a little challenging to say, is that an ambrosia beetle, is that not? Um, whereas if you have stems that are soaked in ethanol and beetles are attacking, well, it's pretty obvious what's going on. Um, the challenge with this, with the soaking the stems or filling them with ethanol is that they will be depleted after about two weeks. So you will have to then generate more. Um, now, I should mention that the traps and these uh, bolts, uh, these ethanol soaked bolts, should be placed within a woodlot or near a woodlot, along the edge of a woodlot, because that's where beetles are going to be emerging from. And um, you want to place them low to the, to the ground. Um, now, in terms of, before I, before I actually go on to the management tactics, I just want to mention that one of the things that we we still need to um, characterize is what the optimal release rate is for these lures. And so the reason why that's of interest to us is there is some evidence that perhaps we might be able to deploy a perimeter of ethanol beta traps along an interception tactic, to deploy a perimeter of traps in a nursery or in an orchard and essentially intercept beetles as they're leaving the woodlot and flying into the cropping system. But in order to catch uh, the, the largest number, the most beetles, we really need to understand what the optimal release rate is uh, for, for those traps. And so that is, again, some uh, a topic of research that we're gonna be pursuing. So in terms of management tactics, okay, so as you can guess, maintaining tree health is, is critical. And you know, the key is to recognize that even though the trees might appear apparently healthy, um, if they're being attacked by ambrosia beetles, uh, then they're emitting ethanol. And, and, and so the key is to then try to understand what stressors may have uh, occurred and, and how can management practices be, be adjusted. Now, I, I fully understand that in some cases, it's like, with free stress and perhaps other stressors that it's really challenging to prepare for that um, or avoid it. Um, but again, this is just the nature of how these beetles are attacking trees. And so it really becomes very critical to understand what fact, which stressors are important in, in, in different locations. In terms of chemical controls, uh, systemics are not infective. So neonicotinoids are not effective. Uh, we found permethrin and bifenthrin based products to be effective, but they're not 100%. And there are several researchers who, uh, 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 and growers and that really are just feel like we do not have a good, and I agree that we really do not have a good uh, chemical control option. Um, the other aspect is that these are essentially being applied preventatively with no guarantee that attacks are going to occur. So now it's problematic from the economic side in terms of the grower applying a pesticide, the cost of applying an insecticide that may or may not even have been needed. And so the understanding tree health and predicting tree health is an important, uh, and trying to predict and broach beetle tax is, a, is important. But again, you know, treatments, if they're going to be applied, should be applied prior to, to peak, peak flight. Um, and the majority of the tax occur on the trunk. Uh, so the key is to make sure you're getting thorough coverage of the trunk. Now, just to demonstrate the importance of tree health, Okay, so this is a flooded tree with no permethrin, um, cumulative attacks on the, on the y-axis. Uh, this is a flooded tree treated with permethrin, so still an average of 30 attacks per tree, so still quite a lot of attacks. 
Uh, and then your non-flooded tree, so no stress, no ethanol, uh, were, were not attacked. And this is on flowering dogwood. And this is, these are, they, were, they were treated with uh, perma, permethrin. Now, the one thing I should mention is that um, we have conducted studies in Ohio, Virginia, and uh, Tennessee, and uh, Mississippi, and we've found, demonstrated that um, insecticide-treated fabric uh, can reduce attacks by ambrosia beetles. So this is um, a flooded tree, flooded tree with untreated mesh, and, and you can see once you have flooded tree plus treated mesh, the, the tax um, drop uh, decrease dramatically. Uh, there are some challenges with this, but again, I wanted to mention it that, that it is something that we're looking into. Um, lastly, I wanna mention that uh, there's interest on part of growers and extension agents, uh, the opportunity to uh, identify uh, trees that are emitting ethanol. So we've been uh, looking at, um, just initially looking at a, a portable device, that, a handheld gas sampling device uh, that was described by Templeton and Colombo uh, that they used to document the emission of ethanol from heat stress, uh, black spruce seedlings, not related to ambrosia beetles. Uh, and so we have since use that and, and demonstrate that yes, we can detect the emission of ethanol using this portable device from trees. And so we're conducting a variety of experiments. Uh, it's an ongoing project to try to optimize this, this process. And we we're using, uh, we've also tested and, and, and have plans to test uh, additional sampling techniques. So uh, ethanol sampling techniques, again, with the idea of trying to predict what trees are, 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 are likely to be attacked. Um, so in terms of these Zyla Sanders beetles, um, living but weakened trees, they might appear apparently healthy, but the beetles are detecting the emission of ethanol. We find them to be poor colonizers of healthy trees. They're essentially bioindicators of tree stress. So when you see attacks by these beetles, uh, they're, they're, they're targeting vulnerable trees. And um, really the challenge is that when you have extreme climatic events or a mild winter followed by frost events uh, or poor drainage, uh, there are others that we don't haven't we don't know about uh, fully understand yet, uh, and so when you have that scenario, it can predispose trees to attack. So the management plan again: maintain tree health, monitor spring flight activity, pre-treatment of trunk if that is um, warranted, and heavily infested trees can serve as a short-term trap tree, essentially allow beetles to attack. Uh, those trees and then after a week or two weeks the tree most likely should be cut down and then discarded but it's not it's a little challenging to predict because it's not necessarily um, a death sentence to have attacks because some trees with a light infestation can recover so it's a, a, a challenging process so um, I know I'm, I apologize for going a little bit over uh, I just want to mention that the Horticultural Research Institute, American Hort, and Floriculture Nursery Research Initiative have been really uh, supportive of us, and uh, we're looking forward to submitting a proposal to SCRI uh, to try to expand what we've learned from ornamentals into tree fruits and uh, tree nuts and um, to help, uh, the, help the industry. A, a number of collaborators are, are listed here. And um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Chris. That was so interesting. Um, I had no idea about any of the parts about ethanol that you mentioned um, or that they would attack particularly vulnerable trees. I, I think it just goes to show that the research that you're doing is really important. So thank you for all the research that you've done so far. Um, thank you, that's very nice of you to say. And we're, well, I know I'm excited to see the next places in your research and, and where you plan to go next. Um, we do have a question that came in our Q&A okay. and they would like to know 
is there any biocontrol agent for this pest where it's native in Southeast Asia? Uh, great question. Not, I mean, all questions are great, right? But that's a great question. And um, I, not that I, not that anyone has specifically searched for or reported. And when I say searched, in other words, there is a branch of biological control referred to as classical biological control, where, for instance, an entomologist will say, okay, this insect has been introduced in Southeast Asia. Let's go to Southeast Asia and let's find the insect and let's see if we can rear any uh, parasitic wasps or identify any um, natural enemies that are controlling this pop the, the populations of this insect in its native habitat. So in that case, nobody's done that to my knowledge with, with these ambrosia beetles. As far as biological control agents, there's only been one parasitic wasp, literally, there's been one parasit, one individual, <laughs> one wasp that's been reported from one gallery, from a tree that was dissected in Germany. And from all the galleries that we've dissected over the years, we've only ever seen one uh, parasitic wasp that was present. Um, we sent it off for identification. It was, it, it was just came back as the, the genera, the species wasn't characterized perhaps. Um, and so as far as parasitic wasps, no. Um, there are uh, beetles called clarid beetles, which are these generalist beetles that uh, will feed on ambrosia beetles. They are attracted to ethanol. Uh, they will feed on bark beetles also, but they're not, they're not um, providing any management options. Um, other biological control agents. Okay, so in terms of uh, there are, are there are uh, there, there's a growing body of evidence. Um, Dave, Sh Dave Shapiro with the USDA is leading these efforts uh, about entomopathogenic nematodes. So can we use nematodes? Can we apply nematodes to the trunk of the tree? And can those nematodes um, a, 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 a provide effective control of the uh, ambrosia beetles? And so that's, again, one of the topics that, we'll, that, that we're going to be proposing as part of our SCRI pro uh, proposal. Um, and so David's spearheading that. And, 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 and um, so really, you know, it's an exciting area. Uh, other biological control agents. Okay, so there's some work that's been done uh, with the USDA and Cornell that evaluated, this with John Van Berg and Luella Castrillo, where they evaluated uh, trico, uh, ent entomopathic, pathogenic fungi, but also antagonistic fungi. So basically parasitic type antagonistic fungi. And so they looked at these, these microbial agents and found that in the case of trichoderma, uh, it, it can reduce attacks on trees. And also it's really, which is fascinating because are the beetles Perceive are the beetles? Is there a repellent? In other words, are the beetles avoiding those trees and not landing on them because they can perceive trichoderma there, or do they land on the tree and then leave or die? Uh, that's an important distinction and an important opportunity, perhaps for novel repellent compounds. Uh, there's also evidence that. Um, uh, strong evidence that that the trichoderma actually disrupts the colonization success of the beetles. So when the female tunnels into the tree, the presence of the trichoderma disrupts perhaps the fungal symbion, um, causes death of the beetle. So there's, you know, there are some promising aspects there. Um, it's limited in some areas and promising in, in other areas. And so we're hoping to continue to try to tease out uh, some of those, those interactions. Thanks for that, Chris.
Mm-hmm. And I, I want to remind everyone, um, if you'd like to see the upcoming webinars uh, for the Southern IPM Hour, or if you'd like to subscribe to our newsletter, you can find all that information at our website, southernipm.org. Again, that's southernipm.org. Um, but one just closing question, Chris, you've talked <laughs> a lot about Well, you've talked a lot about the research you've done and a little about uh, the research that you hope to do. But as you're thinking about uh, the research that's coming up with Ambrosia Beetle, what are you most excited about? Well, okay. I mean, without revealing too much information, I will say one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is um, host tree chemistry. Um, and how that's promoting the growth of the fungal symbiont. So building upon and expanding upon the work that we've done in terms of what role uh, ethanol plays, but really beyond ethanol in terms of um, how host tree chemistry is influencing the colonization of these beetles. I mean, for me personally, I'm biased. I mean, that is a, 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 a really intriguing area um, for me. Um, I'm also particularly fascinated with this concept of uh, entomopathogenic pathogenic fungi and can they be used to repel beetles? How are beetles perceived them? What are volatiles? produced by these fungi uh, are, again, is it a source of a potential source? I mean, certainly it's a potential source of new uh, re- novel repellents. I mean, we don't know, but it, it, it's certainly a good place to look. Uh, that's fascinating to me. Uh, I, I really would, um, I'm, I'm really excited about the opportunity for other researchers who are, who have access to other cropping systems, for instance, and expertise in tree fruits, in tree nuts, for them to, again, understand um, what are the relationships between the interactions between the beetles and the trees that they're attacking, what stressors are important. Uh, Basically, you know, we, we have knowledge from ornamental nurseries. And so I'm excited about the opportunity for other researchers to apply those techniques, apply that knowledge to see how things uh, are occurring in their systems. And so, um, so, I, so that's exciting, the, the, you know, the, the opportunity for, for uh, additional knowledge. I mean, there's still a lot to be understood. Uh, we've made good progress with with ambrosia beetles in ornamental nurseries, but there's still a lot that we don't know. And, uh, you know, the goal is to try to help growers uh, improve their management practices, improve, if necessary, improve production practices. But basically the goal is to help growers to deal with this, these really challenging insects that are really frustrating and can be extremely destructive. I mean, you can really have a significant amount of loss occur very rapidly. And so uh, the goal is to to be able to, to, you know, it's exciting to be able to to work with growers to hopefully um, uh, reduce their losses and reduce production costs. Well, we can't, can't wait to see what you find out. Thank you so much, Chris Ranger, again with USDA ARS. Uh, Thank you so much for coming and thanks for your great presentation today, Chris. Thanks, Caleb. Thanks, Joe.